the Orange County California Social Services Agency Child and Family Service Division was established to protect children from violence, exploitation, abuse, and neglect. The agency's purpose is supposed to be to strengthen families and promote the well-being of children through prevention, intervention, education, and advocacy. Unfortunately, the agency failed that mission when two Orange County social services agents filed false reports and suppressed evidence to illegally remove Deanna Fogarty's two daughters, ages six and nine, from her custody in February 2000 based on the social worker's false information. They lied to the court that Deanna Fogarty, a former Miss California, claiming the children required continued detention due to a substantial danger to their psychological and emotional health, despite knowing there was no such danger. It took Deanna six and a half years and hundreds of thousands of dollars later to regain custody of her children. By then, her daughters were teenagers, and it cost the citizens of Orange County $10.6 million. In this insider-exclusive Justice in America Network TV special, our news team visits with Deanna Fogarty and her attorney, Sean McMillan, in Orange County, California, to go behind the headlines to see how Sean successfully represented Deanna to get justice for her against the Orange County California Social Services Agency Child and Family Service Division. Here's Deanna to share her personal nightmare ordeal on national TV. When the Department of uh, Orange County Social Services um, removed my children, um, it was absolutely devastating. And it's a point in my life that, um, honestly, it, it's a delineation point where it's uh, my life was before it happened and then I have a life after it happened. and. Um, it, it pretty much uh, kills off the person you were before, or, or did in my case. Uh, it took six and a half years to get uh, custody uh, of my children um, back. What kept me going uh, was obviously the love of my children, uh, the uh, heart of a mother that would never give up on their children. Um, and so with that mandate, every day you get up and you fight no matter what shape you're in. And uh, the shape that I was in varied. And um, uh, there were moments where uh, I really wasn't sure I was long for the world, to be honest. And um, uh, and yet I had wonderful support and they'd kind of rally me back and I'd continue the fight. But um, forever changed, no doubt. Sean will also explain what you should do and should not do if Child Protective Services, social workers, come to your door with false accusations. What your rights are as a parent and what your rights are when fighting departments of child family services. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Orange County, California. It's my great pleasure to introduce Sean McMillan to the show. Welcome to the show, Sean. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. We do a lot of shows, you know, they're based on real life legal cases, and oftentimes uh, the lawyers that represent clients uh, started, knew in the beginning they wanted to be a lawyer right from the get-go. You're a little bit different, aren't you? You were in the computer industry for- Right, for 15 years. So how did you make the transition to the legal world? We had a customer come in one day, said he was going to law school. And uh, my dad, I was actually not even there. I was off on my honeymoon with my wife. We'd gotten married several months prior and we were off on our honeymoon. I got a call from my dad and he said that Kit, that was the customer's name, yeah. had, was going to law school, wanted to know if I wanted to go. And he said he thought I should. It's my dad. I generally listen to what he says. So I said, yeah, sign me up. 
and I came back from my honeymoon and went to law school. Right. Um, and I think for the first few years, you were handling a lot of business litigation, but that has also migrated to helping folks dealing with the equivalent of Department of Family Service social workers in their cases, correct? The way that happened is my background was in business. So obviously a natural segue when I'm going into law is to do the sort of work that I did before. So I did a very vibrant business practice. I figured out early on that I enjoyed doing trial work. So I started doing trials for small firms, solo practitioners, people that would do the work up on a case but really didn't like to do the trial work. Tell our audience who Deanna Fogarty is first. Deanna Fogarty, she's a mother, she's a friend, she's a businesswoman, and she's, um, she's a good person. And she came to you because she needed help getting back her kids, right? What happened to Deanna was she was involved in a custody situation with her ex-husband, with her two daughters. One of her daughters had reported during a marriage and family um, therapy session with her therapist some, just some stuff that was inappropriate or sounded inappropriate. The therapist made what's called a mandated report. She's required by law to report to uh, CPS or law enforcement if there is a credible, what she believes, the therapist believes, is a credible allegation of potential child abuse of any kind. So she did that. What ensued was an investigation, and originally both children were detained from the dad. He was only given supervised visits, and they, they reposed with mom, with Deanna. There was a switch up, and one of the social workers that was managing the case. Another social worker took over the case. Yeah, another social worker took, took over the case, exactly. And her name was Marsha. Marsha Vreekin and Deanna had um, difficulty working together. And there was sort of a emotionally charged event that happened at one of the visits between Deanna and Ms. Vreekin. Ms. Vreekin responded to that by going into court and lying about Deanna, claiming that Deanna had told her kids that the father was going to take them away from her and put them in foster care. That never happened. What actually happened, the kids were having trouble in their visits with dad. What actually happened is the worker threaten the kids, to try to get them to cooperate, threaten the kids in private. If you don't visit with your dad, you're going to foster care in a very aggressive way. Well, the kids, they, they melted down, they went nuts, and they come running back to Deanna, and she's like, what, what happened here? And um, so she had a confrontation with Freak, and did you really say these things to my kids? And Freak admitted she did. She admitted it? Yeah, to Deanna in, in that little group session they had. And that is the genesis for the entire case. Because what happened after that? Vreekin goes into court, says, mom did all these things. Judge says, hey, look. Which are lies. Which are all lies. Yeah. Judge says, look, mom, you're done yeah. taking the kids away today, forthwith, and putting them with dad. Right. And then for the next six years, uh, six and a half years. And they're allowed to do that because they're job, they're not allowed to lie, but they're allowed to remove kids if they feel, and they have to be truthful about this, right? If they feel the kids are in jeopardy, right? Well, there, there's a very specific rule that attaches to that. Yeah. They're not necessarily allowed to just willy-nilly remove kids from yeah. families. That there has to be a um, reasonable suspicion that's supported by specific articulable facts to show that the child's in immediate danger of suffering severe bodily injury or death in the two hours it takes to get a court order. And they're expected to be truthful. Absolutely, they, they can't lie. That's the whole mission of Department of Family Services, right? Right. The jury ended up awarding Vienna, uh, I think it was $4.9 million. That's correct. Correct. And, but the Department of Family Services here in Orange County appealed the case. Yeah. And let's talk about some of the basis of the appeal because I think it gets into an issue that we want to talk about is qualified immunity. Right. Okay, they, the jury found that the two social workers had lied. Correct. No question about that. Yeah, no doubt. Correct. So there's an award, it's a big award, you know, almost $5 million, which I think is, was the largest award against the department in history. In it's this still county. the largest award. Okay, so now they 
want to appeal it, and they appeal it on what grounds? On the basis of qualified immunity. And define for our audience what a qualified immunity is. Basically what they mean when they say qualified immunity is, okay, look, what happened here may or may not be unlawful, but we didn't know at the time that we did these things because the law governing our conduct was not clearly established in the courts. Let's back up here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know that we were lying at the time. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, they knew they were lying at the time. Yeah, they, they just didn't know, know it was they illegal. They said they didn't know it was illegal. Yeah. That's, how, that's can, how can anybody say that in a straight face? You know, it, it's funny you ask that because it's basic common sense yes. that you can't lie. I mean, our whole country, if you look back at our founding documents and the yeah. letters and the yeah. treatises that everybody wrote, they talk about the importance of honesty in yeah. government. Yeah. I mean, it's an underlying theme in everything. Okay. So <laughs> conceptually, when you say, well, how could they know they're not supposed to lie? I don't even know how to address that yeah. because it's obvious. I, when I was a kid, I got uh, spanked yeah. with a, a peach sure. to a switch. If I got caught lying, and I assumed everybody went through this. Law and order it cannot be predicated on lies. Right. So the case got appealed. I want to bring out to our audience that the taxpayers pay for this appeal. They the Orange County taxpayers. That's correct. While a case is on appeal, it earns interest. Yeah, 7%. 7%. And the appeal lasted, what, five, six years? Uh, let's see. We got the judgment in March 2007. The Supreme Court did not reject it until yeah. April 2011. Yeah. So for years. approximately four years, yeah. and the interest added up another almost $5 million, correct? Well, there's more to it than just interest. Remember, there's yeah. the $4.9 million judgment from yes. the jury. Then there are trial court awarded attorney's fees, yes. because remember, there's a constitutional sure. violation, so we get paid for the work. Then on top of that, there was another nearly million dollars in state court appellate uh, attorney's fees. Yeah. All of that is earning interest. Right. So it, it was um, roughly eight, $8 million in judgment and attorney's fees that was accruing interest at 7% for four years. So it ended up, I think, the total damage to the Orange County taxpayer of $10.6 million, something like that. Right. That's what I read in the newspaper. Right. It was 9.6 to Deanna, and then the county paid another million something, million two, million one, to their own attorneys. Yeah. Now, I read you had sent me an email that said that as a result of this case, things changed at the Department of Family Services. Is that true? And, no. what, and what changed? Everything changed. There was a wholesale overhaul of the policies, the procedures, training. And, and now this is just in Orange County, so you're clear. This, yeah. there's, there's 58 counties in California. They all have their own way of doing things. Yes. So Orange County today is a different agency than it was back in 2000. A better agency. I think much better. Yeah. And by the way, the two social workers that lied, they still work there, don't they? Well, one of them died. Okay. That was uh, Helen Dwojak. She died. Um, but Marcy Breakin, she still works there. She was promoted. She's she a supervisor. Promoted. She does training. She cost the county $10 million and she got promoted. Got promoted. Only in the government. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have a running joke at my office. The best thing that can happen to a social worker is for us to sue them because their, their career is going to just take off. We have Deanna Fogarty with us right now. So let's bring her on. Sure. It's my great pleasure to introduce Deanna Fogarty. Welcome to the show, Deanna. Thank you. Thanks for being here, seriously. This has been a long haul, hasn't it? It sure has. It has now been, what, 18 years ago? 18 years. That the Department of Family Services came into your house with false allegations and took your kids. In fact, I think they took one of your daughters from school, right? Exactly. Tell us a little bit about how that felt. Oh, wow. Uh, you know, it, that, it's hard to prepare for something like that. In yeah. fact, you don't believe it, anything like that would ever happen to you. Did you have any inkling that something like this might happen? Because as we know from the facts of the case, you had kind of a run in with one of the social workers, right? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you get along with a social worker? I, I really didn't have a problem with the social worker until she proceeded to uh, raise false allegations against me. Why do you think she did that? 
Well, she was trying to cover her her own acts, which were, um, you know, she she threatened my children, and in a very extreme way, to the point where my kids cried and melted down and ran to me. So, yeah. um, that's why she did it. When this first happened to you, unbelievable as it was, what was your first immediate? reaction what did you feel you had to do well it, it feels like a nightmare and you feel like uh, you're going down a rabbit hole really you can't believe it's happening and you keep thinking you're going to wake up but the nightmare continues now you had visitation rights during the six six and a half years that your kids were away from you uh, I had restrict restricted visitation with my children and what does that mean um, you you had to have uh, someone with you a social worker generally or a policeman had to be with you during those visitations. Wow. Um, and that was, where did these take place? The various visits? places, sometimes McDonald's, sometimes. How long would they last? Um, uh, that depended. Everything was based on, on cost also. So it was quite expensive. Cost. Um, it was expensive to hire someone. Um, and so. Uh, that, you had to hire somebody? Yes. Uh -huh. So you had to have kind of a supervisor. Correct. And who would you hire? Uh, police officers, Seriously. social workers. It was all um, agency guided. And you met in public places. Correct. Not in your home. Over time, they allowed us to meet uh, at my parents' home once, um, but generally it was in public places. During the, is it six or six and a half years? Six and a half years it took me During to During the six and a half years that this took place, what were your discussions? Were you allowed to talk to them on the phone? Um, well, not freely. And be supervised too. Correct. Oh, always. Those were always supervised conversations. How did you cope during all of this time? Did you ever think that you would get your daughters back? I never gave up hope, um, and never never gave up the fight to get my children back. Um, that was my end goal, obviously. But um, sure, there's low times where you think, man, this agency is so incredibly powerful, yeah. and uh, they just don't want me to have them back. Yeah. You, uh, as I understand it, you help some other mothers when they're in difficult situations, too, right now, don't you? Um, yeah, I'm open to anybody that's gone through this, and if, I, if what I've gone through can help somebody else, absolutely. Well, we appreciate you being on the show because you being on the show inspires other people that you never give up. Oh, great. Right. Thank you. A lot of people watch these shows, and when the issue is relevant to them, like they're having a problem with, a, with their equivalent of Department of Family Services, what advice do you have to them? Be cooperative. Be cooperative. Yeah, be cooperative. Remember these people that are out investigating. They have a lot of power. They have a lot of power, and they typically do not take well to any kind of pushback. So when they come to a door of a house, and sometimes they come unannounced, correct? Frequently, most of the time. Okay, should you let them in? It depends on the allegations, it depends on... Well, how are you gonna find out about the allegations if they're at the door, you've opened it, we're from the Department of Family Services, what do you want? How can I help you? What yeah. is it you need from me? Yeah. And they'll, t they'll tell you, well, we got these allegations. And they will tell you at the door? They should, if they don't, you gotta make a judgment call at that point in time. If they're coming at you aggressively, and they're not responding to you know, your entreaties, your yeah. request for information, then you have to make a judgment call. Am I willing to let these people in, yeah. consent to them coming into my home, my private life, and doing whatever they're doing in here, or am I gonna stand up right here? Yeah, before they come to a, a house, sometimes they must do an investigation in the neighborhood, like go to neighbors, right? They're, they're supposed to, I can tell you this, yeah. I've, I've deposed hundreds of social workers they typically don't do the type of investigation you would think they would do. Is there any point in time when you invite them in the house, okay, that you should maybe stop answering questions? Do you have any advice there? Yeah, I, I would say when they start getting accusatory. 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 So if their questions, you know, take a turn where it, yeah. it's sounding like, like they're accusing you or your right. spouse of doing something to your kids. What should you say? I would just stop it and say, look, you know what? we need to stop right here. I need to get a hold of an attorney. I need to know what my rights are. Right. And what are their rights? What are their rights? It's just like a police invasion. This is something that's that's odd to me that, that the social workers don't get and typically people don't get yeah. is that you have the same rights as you would if you're being interrogated by a police officer for committing a crime. Yeah. 
All right, even though this, the dependency process is civil yeah. in nature, the same fundamental rights are at stake. You're, you're potentially going to lose your family. Yeah. That's a liberty interest that's protected. Right. All the protections that come into play, the warrant requirements, the 14th Amendment due process requirements, all those come into play in the context that we're talking about here. What if the social worker wants to interview your kids? That's a, an emerging area of law right now. If you have siblings, say there's accusations about one but not the other, yeah. In my view, under the current law, you are permitted to refuse to allow the social workers to interview the child as to whom there are no allegations. Because that's an investigatory interview, potentially looking to pin something on somebody. It yeah. falls under the rubric of the Fourth Amendment, 14th Amendment due process. Immediately after a visit from the Department of Family Services, would you recommend anybody contact an attorney? Absolutely everybody. Can you record? Can you say to the social worker, I'd like to record this? It depends whether you're doing it legally or unlawful. Well, you're asking for their permission. Yeah, and if they, if they deny you permission. Can they deny you permission? According to them, they can. We haven't litigated this issue yet. Okay. What I tell clients in California, California is a two-party state. What I tell them here is, look, it's only a misdemeanor. I have never seen a county prosecute anybody. To record someone without their permission. It's only a misdemeanor. Or to record somebody if they don't give you permission, but you're still recording it anyway. Right. That's just a misdemeanor. misdemeanor. I've never seen anybody prosecuted for that in California. Secondarily, there is a line of law that yeah. suggests that you are permitted to record a public official in the disposition of their official duties. Really? Meaning, social worker, public official, right. in here investigating, right. you have an argument that you're, you have a right to record her or him. You must get a lot of calls from people in similar circumstances. Hundreds. Hundreds of calls. How do you select the cases that you eventually end up taking? I talk to them and I try to figure out, number one, whether or not I believe them. Yeah. And whether or not, you know, they I feel like they have what it's going to take to make it all the way through. It's going to be a long journey. It's going to be a long journey. It's going to be a costly journey, both uh, financially and emotionally, for everybody involved. Yeah. And they have to be somebody I can get along with, because it's almost like choosing a spouse. We're going to be together for 10 years, you know, eight years, sometimes longer. My average case lasts between eight and nine years. Yeah. We're going to be together a long time. We have to be able to get along. Thank you for being on the show. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.